it is uh, 10.30. I am going to get started. So last time we talked about the SR latch and also the truth table of the SR latch. This is basically where we are currently at in terms of our teaching material. On Wednesday, we have our second exam. So do we have any questions about the second exam? Do I need what? Oh, the first exam, yes. So we have our first exam class. Yeah. Do we have any questions about the first exam or exam one? No. Okay, all right. So we're gonna get started with um, this material again. All right. So last time we talked about the SR latch, which is you know the you know this particular section, and we concluded that the SR latch has a interesting truth table, which is this one here. So the truth table of the SR latch basically says you know if both S and R are zeros, then we know the output Q and NQ, which are both ones. If S is a zero, R is a one, we know the output. Q would be a 1 and NQ would be a 0. If S is a 1, R is a 0, we know the output is going to be Q being a 0, NQ being a 1. But when S and R are both 1s, it is just no change. In other words, however we transition into the 1-1 one, one as both input pins is going to be remembered. So whatever the output states were will be maintained as we transition to 1-1 one, one as both inputs. So this is how the SR latch, you know, quote unquote, is a memory device. So what we'll do today is we'll introduce the other memory devices as well. So the next one up is called a deep flip flop, which is also, you know, basically it's a level sensitive deep flip flop. Um, so instead of you know, just going through each one, you know, I will kind of skip ahead and go to the uh, this particular one here. This is a clock and gated you know, deep flip flop. So what we do have here are three inputs. There's a clock, there's an enable, there's a data, and there's a single output which is Q. So in this in this particular design, we make use of three SR latches. So we have SR1, SR2, and then also SR3. And then on top of that, we also have Q and Q. One is A1 and one is A2. These are not NAND gates, okay? They are regular NAND gates. So this circuit is kind of interesting. So what we'll do is going to build this circuit first in Logisim, and then we'll go ahead and play with it a little bit. Um, all right, so let me go to a command line and just start up Logisim. <clears throat> All right, this is the same. So the first thing I need to do is to create the SR latch, which is a component that we need in this design. So we go to add circuit, and we just call this SR latch. <clears throat> the SR latch needs two input pins, and it has two output pins. And in between, we have two NAND gates. So we'll just go ahead and build a circuit really quick. And then we go to logic gates, to pick out a NAND gate, and then we'll go ahead and change the design to a narrow and only limit to two input pins because that's all we need. So here's one, duplicate, and then put the other one down here. I think that'll work. All right, so this is the top NAND gate, and this is the bottom NAND gate. And then the interesting part of a NAND, uh, of an SR latch is the output of one NAND gate goes to the input of the other one and also vice versa like so. There we go. So now we have a NAND gate. Oh, okay, I just, uh, okay. My mistake, I forgot. It has to go to the other input of the opposite NAND gate. So this one goes here and then this one goes to the bottom here with go. All right, so this is a basic SR latch. 
and we have done this already in the previous class. So for today's class, you know, I'm not too concerned about you know, this particular design, and I'm just using it as one of the components. So to use this as a component, it is good to remember which pin is which pin. So we have Q and then N Q over here. <clears throat> just have to reposition the letters a little bit better, just so that it, I mean, just make it look nicer. Go. Okay, so I think it looks good enough. So now we actually go ahead and build the actual circuit. So this one is a uh, D flip flop, but it is also you know, the D flip flop that has kind of the edge sensitive, okay, so ES, and also it is gated, so it's a G. So I'll talk about you know, why it is called you know, that. <clears throat> and I need to duplicate the design, and the quickest way or one way to do it is for me to take a snapshot of this so that I can make this you know, picture you know, stay shown using the program here. And then just make sure that it stays always on top. So this way, when I switch back to larger scenes, you know, the picture is going to be, you know, I always get to see a picture in the picture. So now I'm going to replicate the design. The first pin is, the first input pin is the clock pin. And the clock pin is controlling the timing. So when we actually make this work, you know, we'll see why it is called a clock pin. This is the enable pin. So as the name implies, the enable pin is here because the device can be turned off. It can be disabled. So the enable pin is here to make sure that you know, can control whether it's on or not. The data pin is important because you know, this is the pin that specifies, are we supposed to remember a zero or one? So the zero or one to be remembered is input uh, through the data pin. And as far as output pins are concerned, we only have one, and that's our Q output pin. And now you know, in between, we're gonna have to rely on three SR latches. So now we go to our own SR latch component and make three of those. So here's another one, and oh, okay. I got one too many. Get rid of this one, there we go. All right, so this is the last one, <clears throat> and it's always good to name the component, because once I name the component, I can refer to this one. So this one is the SRC. This one at the top is SR1. And this one here at the bottom is called SR2. So um, I'm just looking at the design here. I think we're good. So we also need two AND gates. So we go to the AND gate here. And this is way too big. You know, I need it to be a lot smaller. One only has two inputs. That's our A1. So we will go ahead and reduce the number of inputs to just two. This is A1. And then the other one, oops, that's two. And this is the duplicate of this. You know, this is A2, which has three inputs like so. Now we'll position A1 and A2 sort of like in a diagram. So we'll just put this one right about here and we're gonna put this one right about here. Okay, so now we just have to kind of draw the diagram. This one has a lot of nodes, okay? So when we look at the output of um, NQ or slash Q, it goes to the S port of SRC. Um, you know, drawing this Y here. And the, it also goes all the way to the first input of A2. So go ahead and make the bad happen. There we go. So now I'm done with this node. Uh, the other one is simply going to Q from SR2 to R of SRC. So this is Q of SR2. And then we just have to bring it to R of SRC. So that's a pretty easy node. The NQ of SR2, however, goes all the way to the S of SR1. So that's going to take some. Okay, I will make it go ahead and fly over the top of SR1 to go to the S input pin of SR1. And that completes that particular wire. 
And then the output of H1 goes into R of SR1, like so. And now we have to handle your A1 and M2, A1 and A2. Uh, the top input of A1 goes to the enable pin, and so is the middle one of A2. So these two are both going to the EM pin, which is the enable pin. And then the bottom input pin, oh, okay, I just, nope, that is correct. The clock pin goes to both A1 and A2. So A1, the second input pin of A1, and also the third input pin of A2, they're both going to the clock pin. This is the clock pin. Okay. And then the data pin goes you know, only to the R of the SR2, uh, SR latch. So there we go. And then the output of A2 goes to the S input pin of SR2, like so. So I can double check, you know, do a quick sanity check. The only output pin that is not connected, or there are two. One is Q of SR1, Q of SR1. The other one is NQ of SRC. This is the NQ of SRC. Everything else are connected. So I think I got the diagram, diagram correct. Okay, so now I'll first illustrate how it works from the perspective of um, Logisim, and then we'll go ahead and try to analyze how does it work. Okay, so we'll I'll go ahead and close uh, this window first because we don't really need it anymore. I'm referring to this one here because this is the circuit. So now the next thing we need to do is to um, just exercise. Okay, how does it work? The reason why SRC has an output that is E, which is error is because you know, the SR latch does not have a default startup state. So when we connect both ones to the S and the R pin at the same time, basically, um, it just, uh, we're just asking the SRC, SR latch, to remember whatever it had before. But we never really specified you know, the, curve, the initial state of SR pin. And that's why it's outputting an E, because we cannot really, we don't know how it is supposed to be uh, set up you know, initially. All right, so the way this works is if you think about a camera, the data pin is kind of like the lens of a camera. Okay, you know, this is where information comes in. Now, but are you recording that information or when do you record the information? Yeah, that's uh, a few other things that can control it. The EN is more or less like the on off button of a digital camera. Okay, so you have to turn the camera on before you can do anything else. Okay, so the enable pin is like the on off button of a digital camera. And then finally, we have CLK, which is called the clock pin here. But I think it can also spell click, okay, with CLK, which is exactly what it does on a digital camera. You have to remember to press the shutter release in order to take a picture. Are we doing okay so far with the three components, or the three input pins? you know, as analogies to a digital camera. One is the lens, one is the on-off button, and then one is the shutter release. Are we good so far? Okay. In 10 years, which is probably after I retire, the analogy of using a camera is not going to work because I can talk about digital cameras all day long, and then the class goes like, I, we don't know what is, what is a camera. We don't know what, what a camera is. Because everybody just has a cell phone, you know, and use it as a camera. But that day will come, just not today yet, hopefully. All right. So now that we have everything set up here, let's go ahead and try to ask, ask this particular device to remember this particular zero here. So zero is already here. The first thing you need to do is to turn on the camera. So that means your enable has to be a one. And then you have to click, okay? CLK is clock, but you can also see it's click. So it is only at the transition when the clock pin goes from zero to one that the device will mirror whatever state the data pin is to the uh, output of the entire device. Okay, so the transition is you know, the key. So now we'll go ahead and click the CLK or the clock pin and it remembers you know, what the data pin is. 
Are we doing okay so far? All right. So at this point, okay, I can have a falling edge. Now, from a zero to a one, it's called a rising edge. From a one back to a zero, it's called a falling edge. So the falling edge doesn't do anything. If I turn off the enable, then I can change the data input pin, and I can clock it any way I want, and you can see nothing happens to the output. So in order to capture this new input state of one, you need to first turn on the camera, which means your know, enable needs to be a one first. Then you have to click the CLK so that it is going from zero to one, and right at that instant, you know, the output becomes a one. Are we doing okay so far with this particular design? Okay. Now, is it kind of complicated compared to an SR latch? Yes. Okay, because it actually uses what? Three SR latches in this design by itself. So the next question is why do we have to make it so complicated? So the reason why it is so complicated is the EN and the top is served different purposes. EN is specifying who should be paying attention to the data pin. You go like, but there's only one device here. Well, this is a sample circuit, okay? We only have one device connected to what we call the data pin. But in an actual design, there can be multiple of these devices connected to the same wire. And sometimes you only want this one to update, sometimes you want that one to update. So by controlling which device has the enable being a one, you can now specify who should be updating. In other words, EN, is for controlling who should be updating. The clock, on the other hand, is controlling when that should be updated. Okay, so there's who and then there's when. So these two pins over here, one is specifying who should update, the other one is specifying when to update. <clears throat> so you might want to take notes, okay, because you know, the notes you know, may ha have mentioned this, but you know, it's probably important to kind of write down in your own words, you know, what these two pins are actually doing. All right, so this looks simple enough, okay? So now what, we, what I want to do is to capture this particular design in, um, in the spreadsheet so that we can actually analyze you know, how this whole thing is gonna happen. So this spreadsheet is gonna be quite complicated because the number of nodes of this design is a lot, okay? But it doesn't mean that we cannot do it. We just, you know, have to use the same rules as we have been using, you know, since last one week ago, which is last Monday, okay? So because last Monday was the time when we um, did the uh, P NCPD discussion. So we're gonna use exactly the same approach in today's class. All right, so to do that, I am going to kind of shrink the design a little bit here because I don't want it to take up all the space on the screen. So I'm just gonna take a little snapshot here, use the same trick, okay? So this way I can leave the design up on the display and I can minimize Logisim for now. And then what I'll do also is to go to uh, the Google Drive, okay? because I'm going to create a trace just the same way as we did on last Monday, except this time it is a little bit more complicated because the design is quite a bit more complicated than the ones that we did last week. <clears throat> All right, so I put this into the shared folder. So that means you know if you go to the shared folder and you look for the Google Sheets of today's date, you will find it, you know, what exactly what I'm creating right now. So now, you know, I just need to change the uh, name of the spreadsheet to today's date, 2024-0930. And you should be able to see it now if you go to the shared folder. There's a link, you know, under course information in Canvas. So that's how you can get to the files that I worked on, you know, in my class. All right, so let's go ahead and you know, work with this one. So this time I'm gonna use a slightly different approach. So on row one, I am going to indicate the name of the device. So we got clock, we got EN, <clears throat> we also have data, and then we have A1. And let me shrink the columns a little bit first. So this might take a little bit of time to kind of perfect because there are a lot of components. 
A1 itself is going to take up three columns. Okay, so these two columns also belong to A1. We'll, we'll kind of you know, specify all the details later on. A2, on the other hand, is going to take up four columns because A2 has one has three input pin and one output pin. So I'm what I'm doing right now is I'm just making sure that I have enough columns and I'll shrink these, okay, so they don't have to be wide because each one can only be a zero or one. So it doesn't take up a whole lot of space. And then we got SR1. SR1 is going to take up four columns too because it has two inputs and two outputs. So these four would be for SR1. And then we have SR2, which also take up, takes up four columns because it has two inputs and two outputs. And then finally, we have SRC. Oh, actually not quite final, but we are close. So SRC also has four columns, okay, because every SR latch has two inputs and two outputs. And then finally, we have um, Q, which is the output port output pin. And that only has one single port, so that's why it only takes up one column. All right, so looking at this, it is a little bit busy. And then the column A only has the input A1 with an NC versus a PD. So we can barely fit everything on the same screen. Are we doing okay so far with the spreadsheet at this point? So I'm using the next row to indicate which port we are talking about. Now, clock is an input pin, so it only has one, you know, quote unquote, default, you know, default port. So we just say port over here. Same with EN, same with data. A1, on the other hand, is a two input AND gate. So we have IN0 and IN1 as our input pins and it has an output pin. A2 is a three input AND gate. So it has IN0, IN1, and IN2. It also has an output pin. SR1 is an SR latch. It has S as an input port. R as an input port, Q as an output port, and Q also as an output port. Same with SR2 and SRC. So I'm just going to be lazy and copy and paste you know, those four ports. And then Q as an output pin only has you know, one single port because you know, that's all it is going to be. So it doesn't really do much other than just reflecting the state of a wire. That's basically what it's for. So I think I got everything here. Okay. So what, what makes this design even more difficult to track is because of the number of nodes. So now we have to deal with the nodes here. So uh, when we deal with the nodes, this is one node here. It connects to, it connects from the CLK. This is port, uh, node zero. It connects it to the second input of A1 and also the last input of A2. So these are all belonging to the same node. So let me just pause here. Does everybody understand what I'm doing right now? Okay. In other words, I'm turning a graphical design, which you see at the upper right-hand corner, into a text representation so that I can track all the changes that is going to happen. Are we doing okay so far? Does everybody understand what a node is? Okay. All right, so we'll track down you know, the EN port here. It goes to the first input of A1, so this is node one. And it also goes to the middle input of A2, so it'd be this one. So all the ones on row one you know, correspond to node number one. I just number the node in sequential numbers, zero, one, two, and so on. There's no particular reason why you know, the first one is la labeled zero. I could have started with like 26, okay, if I wanted to. But you know, starting with zero seems to make the most sense. So the data port or the data input pin is only connected to the R of SR2. So this SR2 and this is R, they belong to node two. All right, so let's check out what is the output of A1. The output of A1 connects to two different places. So this would be node three. It connects to S of SRC, so that's three. It also connects to the first input of A2, so that's three over here as well. Now we look at the output of A2. It is a pretty short node, 
it will be node number four. All it does is just connect to the S of SR2, so that's node four. And then we look at the S of SR1, it is, so let me go back to the picture here. They're trying to track down this wire. It only goes from, huh? Say that one more time. The output of A1 only connects to R. That is correct. So we have three. You uh, are correct. So this only goes to. Okay, so th I got this wrong. The output of A1 connects to R of SR1. So it's supposed to go. So I was tracking the wrong wire. Okay, very good. So A2 only goes to S of SR2, so that is correct. So now we have to look at um, the in zero of A2. That connects to the one that we were just working with. Okay, so this four, okay, let's get rid of the four first because we are, we are uh, re-sequencing the number. So make this one four, which is the first input of A2. It connects to N cube of SR1. So this is N cube of SR1. It also connects to S of SRC. So this is S of SRC. And now we work on the output of A2, which only, can, this is, this would be node five. It goes to S of SR2, so, and then SR1S is number <coughs> 6, it connects to NQ of SR2, like so, and then the Q is not connected anywhere, you know, out of SR1, so we just leave it blank because it, it doesn't connect to anything else. The Q of SR2, on the other hand, connects to R of SRC, so that would be node seven, connects to the R of SRC, and then the Q of SRC, that would be node eight, connects to the port of the output pin Q itself. That completes the whole thing. All right, so we got nine different nodes, okay, and a lot of devices. It doesn't really change how it works, okay? The way we track down the changes is still pretty much the same. All right, so now we will say that everything is unknown to begin with, okay? So that's always the case when you start up the circuit, everything is unknown. So they're all, they're all question marks here. And the first one is always an NC, okay? And in fact, this one is usually bold-faced because I want to emphasize, you know, this is where we change one of the input pins to a certain state. So let's just say that, you know, over here, we enable, we change the data port from whatever it was to a zero, okay, which is replicate what we did earlier. So now we have to look at the NC row and ask, okay, who else is on node two? So when you look up what is on node two, this is also on node two. As a result, this one is also updated to the same zero, and that's it. Then we have to go for a PD row, a propagational delay, so after a propagational delay, we want to figure out what is going to happen to SR2. Because SR2 is the only one that has one of the input pins changed from whatever it was, which is unknown, to now a zero. So the question is, can I, can I claim anything about the output pins or the output ports of SRS and SR2? So the quick way to answer this question is to refer to the truth table of the SRF. So let's go ahead and do that. So I'm going back to the notes here, and we are taking a look at the um, SR2 latch, SR, SR, the SR latch truth table. So we go back to the SR latch truth table, which is up here, and we are basically asking if we know that the R, was it the R? That's another number. Let's take a look. Yeah, it is the R input, it's a zero. Can we conclude anything about the output? 
Okay, I'll let you guys tell me. If the R is a zero, do we know anything for sure about the R? Yes. The N2 is going to be one. That is correct. Okay. Now we won't know what is happening to Q because you know that it cannot be determined by just knowing R is being a zero. Because when you look at this row, when R is zero, N Q is a one. When R is zero, N Q is also a one. Now, what about Q itself? Well, that one we don't know, okay, because it depends on what the S pin is, and we don't know the current state of the S pin. All right, so we can just claim that the N Q is going to be a one, which is fine, okay. So we now go here, and we say N Q is known to be a one just because we know the R input pin is a zero. Is that okay? So that's the one single transition because of the propagational delay. And then after that, we have an NC. So every time we have an NC, we are basically looking at how zeros and ones you know, get changed because of connectivity. So now we can look at node six, okay? Because it is node six that got changed, okay? One of the output pins connected to node six is changed. So as a result, we have to look up all the six and find out you know, who else is going to change to a one. Column L says you know, this is the only one that is going to change because it is also connected to node six. And now we go for another PD. So this time we are looking at SR1 and then we ask, just knowing that the S input pin is a one, can we make any claims about the output ports of the same SR latch? So once again, we go to the um, truth table. So this time um, we know that the S pin is a one, okay? So if we know the S pin is a one, ah, we really cannot make any conclusion because depending on what R is, okay, we may end up with a zero or one, or we may not see any changes from before. So we really don't know what's going to go, what's going on here. So as a result of this, we basically cannot make any claims. So that means we are now at a steady state because you know, the, um, the entire design is basically at a point where, okay, we have made all the changes that are possible to determine, and that's it. Are we doing okay so far with this simulation? In other words, we are doing the, everything by hand. Instead of having larger sim to do all the work for us, we're doing this by hand. So the next NC is you know, another pin being changed or another input pin is getting a specific value. So let's just say that we want to enable this particular device so that we can, we're ready for a clock, okay? So now we turn EN from some unknown value to a one. So that's node one. And you know, because this NC is the initial one right after a steady state, so that means you know, every node one or every port that connects to node one is gonna be a one as a result. So there's another one over here, there's another one over here. So all of these are turned into one. Now, we, then we look into this one here. This is a, a input to an AND gate. So do we know the output because one of the inputs of an AND gate is a one? What do you guys think? What does the truth table of an end operator looks like? Well, we kind of need to know what the other one is, okay? Because having just one input of an end being a one does not give me enough information to conclude what the entire gate is going to do. So that means, ah, okay, I cannot put any item here. And then the same you know, reasoning also applies here. Because it just be just knowing that one of the input of A2 is a one cannot tell me what the output is going to be. So that means, oh, okay, the entire PD row is empty, which means we are once again at a steady state. Is that okay so far? All right. So in order to have a transition from zero to one, the next pin that we are going to change is going to be the clock pin. We have to start with a zero first, and then we will go ahead and change it to a one, you know, after we have reached the steady state here. All right, so this is node zero. So we now look up all the nodes zero, which would include these two, and we have to remember to change both of them to zeros, okay? Aha, 
So this time we can do something about the PD because as an AND gate, if at least one input is a zero, the output is going to be a zero, okay? You know, because it's an AND, not a NAND, okay? This is a regular AND gate. So if at least one input is a zero, we know the output has to be a zero. The same applies over here. Now, if the PD row is changing at least one output port, then we need another AND key, okay? Because that output port may connect to other input pins. So we have another NC over here, and then we look at this particular item, okay? We look at this transition. It is on a node three, so that means every other node three also need to change the value to this zero. There's only one other one here. And then we also have to remember node five is also changed to a zero because the output of A2 is also changed to a zero. So we have to look up all the node five. Here's another node five. So that one also needs to be changed to a zero. That's the result of the node connectivity part. And I'm gonna do this thing here, okay, just so that it's easier for us to scroll the bottom without you know, scrolling the top. So because the NC row is not empty, now we have to go for another PD. This time we are looking at this transition here, okay? So this transition is basically saying, now we know the S pin of SR1 is a one, the R pin of SR1 is a zero. Does that help me determine the actual output of SR1? Look at the truth table, okay? So let's go ahead and look at the truth table. We have one zero as the input. So if we have one zero as the input, yes, we know what the output is supposed to be. It should be zero and one. So now we go back here and then we say the output should be a zero here and a one over here. And then we look into SR2. It has both inputs being zero at this point. So the output should be one and one, but this one is already here. So we don't even write a one here because it is not a transition. Are we still doing okay so far with the alternating NC and PD rows? And do we understand you know, what each row is trying to select? Okay, all right, so let's go continue. <laughs> this is going to be a little bit long because even though Q is not connected to anything, you know, it, it, there's no node connecting to Q, and Q does connect to node 4. So that means when we change NQ of SR1 to, to 1, you know, everything that connects to a four also need to change to a one because of how they are connected by the nodes. So that means, okay, now we have to you know, follow up by a bunch of changes because you know, who else is on four? Uh, this one is on four. So that also needs to change to a one. And then this one is also on four. That also has to change to a one. And then we also have this one changed. This is the Q output of SR2, which is on node seven. So now we have to change everyone on node seven to a one as well. There's only one here. So we now change this one to a one. All right. Now, because the NC ended up changing some of the input pins you know, from you know, whatever it was to something else. So now we have to follow by another PD again. So P this particular PD is looking up who just got one of the input pins changed or at least one input pin changed. A2 got one of the input pins changed. So A2 having three inputs, one input is still a zero, which means the output continues to be a zero. We don't have to put anything here because it is not a change. We look at this one here and also this one here. They both belong to SRC, but because SRC is a uh, SR latch, having both inputs being ones also doesn't tell us anything about what the outputs are supposed to be because one one as inputs to a SR latch simply means maintain your current state, okay? And we do not know what the current state is. So that means we now cannot say anything about these two cells. And as a result, we are now at a steady state again. Are we doing okay? All right. So now we finally want to change the clock pin from a zero to a one. So this is also an NC. But this time I am going to bold face it because it is reflecting a change to the input pin. And the change is the clock pin transitioning from a zero to a one. So this one is also going to be bold faced. So now what do we do? 
Well, we have to look at this is node zero. So everyone who is on the node zero also need to change to the same value. So now we have to say, this is now a one, and this is also now a one. And then because you know this one here is corresponding to an input of A1, this one here is corresponding to an input of A2, now we have to go for a PD because we can potentially have changed the output of N1, N or N2, uh, A1 or A2. So now we look at A1, we look at the output of A1 and ask, uh, is it potentially changed? What do you guys think? How do we read this? What are the current inputs of A1? If you see a blank, it means look up, okay? So that means, you know, this blank here, corresponding to in zero of A1 is a blank. You look up until you see something, it is a one. This one here, you look up, it is also a one. So A1 is now having both input pins being ones, which means the output should be a one. But it was a zero before, it is a change, so now I have to type a one here. What about A2? Kind of the same deal, okay? If you look at A2, because you know, if you look up this, which is in zero, it has a value of one. This is in one, it also has a value of one. This is in two, which just got to a one from a zero. So once again, A2 is also having three inputs all being ones. As an end gate, it is also going to change the output from a zero to a one. So that means we have another NC because you, as, as long as you have at least one output port that connects to a specific node changing its state, you need another NC so that that change can be spread to um, all the other ports of the same node. So this is on node three. So now we have to change everybody on node three to a one. So we only got one over here. So now that one is also changed to a one. And then we also have node five being changed to a one. So now everybody on node five also need to be changed to a one. So this is our other node five over here. So node three and five got changed. Okay, so that's it. Now we move on to the next PD row. So this is the next PD. So on this particular PD row, we are looking at SR1 potentially changing its output. So let's take a look at what it had before. Okay, so this is getting a little bit harder to read. Um, let me see if I can do this. I'm maximizing the screen so I can scroll up a little bit. So this way we can actually see the whole thing. So we can see that on this particular PD row, SR1 has a value, okay, the S pin of SR1 is a one already. And then the R of SR1 was just changed to a one. But having both ones for an SR latch means we are maintaining Q and NQ. So that means I don't have to write anything here because whatever it was, which is zero and one, is now maintained. What about uh, SR2? Because SR2 also has one of its input pins changed. So let's check out what is SR2 currently. So SR2 is now a one. By, followed by a zero, you know, S is a one, R is a zero. So if we look up the truth table, now we know the uh, output is going to be a zero for Q and a one for NQ. So now we need another NC because even though, oh, they're both connected to actual nodes, so we definitely need an NC. So now we look at this zero, it is on node seven. So everybody on node seven need to change to a zero at this point. So this is the one that needs to change to a zero. Yep. I think NQ is already one. NQ is already a one. Yep, it is. Thank you. So we're gonna take this one out because it's not a transition. Thank you. But this one is a transition, which means you know now we are changing, you know, the um, R input pin of SRC from a one to a zero, okay? And because that corresponds to an input port, so we have to go for another PD again. <laughs> so now this time we only have to look at SRC because SRC is the only component 
that has at least one input port being changed by the previous NC row. So now we look at SRC, the S pin is a one, the R pin is a zero, which means we know what the output is supposed to be. Q is supposed to be a zero, and NQ is supposed to be a one, okay? Almost there, almost there, okay? Because Q is uh, connected to a particular node, which is number eight, so we need one more NC here so that this particular chain of node eight is also reflected here. Okay, there we go. And then the next, technically we need another PD, but the next PD is not gonna do anything because as an output port, output pin, Q doesn't really affect anything else. Okay, so when the port of output pin Q is changed to a zero, and that's the only change here, so the next PD is gonna be a steady state again. Is that okay? Now, this is a really, really long trace, and it's, it's, and it's complicated, but the process is no different from what we did on last Monday. The only difference here is we now treat the SR latch as one single device. We, don't, we do not look into the SR latch and say, oh, it has got components in it. We just treat it as one single thing. Are we doing okay so far with this trace? Okay, all right. So the bottom line is, um, is this consistent with what we talked about earlier by running this particular device through LogiSim? The answer is, yeah. We changed the data pin to a zero, we enabled the device, and then we have one rising edge on the clock, which ended up reflecting the state of the, in the data pin to the Q port as the output. Yes, go ahead. Mm -hmm. That is correct. Yep. So when you, so you're you're absolutely correct. Um, but when we look at Logisim, okay, let me go back to Logisim right now. So when you do the same experiment in Logisim, so let me go ahead and reset the whole thing. So we'll go ahead. Um, in fact, what I'm do, what, what I'm going to do is to be able to specify unknown for the input pin. So I'm going to change all of these to having three state being of yes, because that will allow me to specify unknown value as well. So I can basically check this to become an X, which means I don't know what it is. I don't know what this is. I don't know what that is. So now we, I can also reset the simulation. So this is basically the same thing as the initial state of the trace, okay? The first thing we did was to change the data pin from unknown to a zero or one, whatever it is, zero, I think it was. And then we turn it on, so enable becomes a one. And then we turn the clock to a zero, and then we turn it into a one. And you can see you know, the, um, log, the simulator is giving us exactly the same outcome. However, the simulator does not do one thing that we were able to do in the, in the actual trace is it does it only goes it only gets us to the steady state right away in other words every single time we make a pin change which is on an nc row that is both faced it will give us the actual steady state all the way at the end but it doesn't give us any of the internal transitions between the change of the input pin and the steady state now this between these rows is not a big deal okay there's not a whole lot going on between these two no big deal either but between these two, uh, there's a lot of stuff going on, okay? And in between the last one, there's also a lot, a lot of stuff going on between the initial change to the input pin to the time that we get to a steady state. So this table in a trace like this, we are actually tracking down a lot more transitions than logic sim can possibly do. Is that okay? So it still does it. It is just But there are things like, you know, if you get into an oscillation, then Logisim will just say that, okay, this is not working, it's an oscillation, but it doesn't tell you why it is an oscillation. If you do it this way, you will also know why it is oscillation. 
just you know, we visualize in every single possible change, you know, in the tiniest you know step possible. So that's why you know this is a much better way of actually understanding how a circuit works. Is it tedious? Absolutely. <laughs> okay, there's no pretense that this is not tedious. But at the same time, it is also a very important technique in order for you to look at a circuit like the ones that we are working with and be able to tell exactly how it is going to work. You're not only tell you're not only looking at the actual input pins and the output pin and know that you know, between the change of the input pin and the steady state, you know, you're also looking into every single step in between. Now, why is that important? It is important because if you are actually designing a chip, okay, and you need to know the timing, this becomes important because now we can, we can count how many PDs it took for us to get to a steady state. It took one, two, three, before we get to a steady state. So that means at the time when we change one of the input pins, it took a quite a bit of long time before we get to the steady state, which also means you know, we can now determine how fast can this device possibly work because you know, now you know how much time it takes in terms of PD units. Does that make sense? So for people who are actually designing the processor, which is basically the job of a computer engineer, knowing how to work this out is very important. The people, the best of the people, you know, computer science people who only care about programming, this is not very important, okay? I mean, yeah. What, <clears throat> what was the reason you said for starting you know, to Because uh, you can start with a one, okay. but nothing is going to happen until it transitions from the zero to a one. Okay. So this is reflecting the actual transition from a zero to a one. Because you know, the zero being presented at the clock ends up here. Okay, This is the, the steady state when the clock is a zero. But when you transition the zero to a one, it has to go through all of these steps in order for the output of the entire device to reflect what the data pin has. So it's yep. just to show changes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. So even though to us it is at the instant of time, you know, which is you know, the, the single instant of time when the clock pin goes from zero to one, but internal to the entire device, it actually took quite a few steps in order for the final change to, to, be, to be stabilized. All right. Is that okay so far? All right. <clears throat> so now we go back to the notes. Okay, let me just, I'll go ahead and take a roll today. So let's go ahead and take a roll. And basically, it gives you guys a little bit of time to kind of absorb the material. This is today's roll taking activity. It is 2024-0930. And then the Passcode is not very surprising. NC. It's just no connectivity, or if you prefer, no change. So it's NC or lowercase. So I'm gonna write it on the whiteboard. NC. So while you guys are doing this, I'm going to scroll to the bottom of the module. Because we got another design that's even crazy, but I'm not going to trace that one. <laughs> Let's start with this one. Okay. Looks like most people are done with the road taking activity. I think I made the time you'll do at what thirty. So just give me another five minutes. So when you look at this design, you look at you compare that to the previous one, what has changed? Okay. So it's always good to try to recognize what is changed between the designs because you know that way you can go like, ah, okay, so those are the only changes, but what would that do? So in this case, when we look at okay, I I I know what I need to do. I'm gonna do the same trick as before. Okay, take a screenshot so I can show both designs side by side. Okay, this is gonna this 
make it always on top. And then I can scroll the other window. And finally, we can line up both of those. And you guys can go like, OK, so what did I change? On the right hand side, we have the original, which is the edge sensitive change in disease flip flop. And then on the left hand side, we got one extra pin. And we also got something you know, between SRC and the rest of the circuit. These two are new components. There's an OR gate, and there's also another AND gate. So the question is, what does it do? Okay, so let's think about what happens when reset is a zero. Okay, so just imagine that reset is a zero. This zero is going to go to A3. A3 is an AND gate. If one input is a zero, what do we know about the output? That's the output. It has to be a zero. If this bar is automatically going to be a zero, which means Q is automatically going to be a zero. Okay. Okay. If the R pin is a zero, Q is going to be a zero. So this circuit gives us a chance, and then tell the other one is O1. So O1 is an OR gate. This is a negation. Okay, the bubble here is the same as the negation. So the zero of reset is negated before it goes into an OR gate, which means it becomes a one. So that means the OR gate is going to output a one, and that one is going to go to the S pin. So that means if reset is a zero, S of SRC is going to be a one, R of SRC is going to be zero, which guarantees that the output is going to be a zero. It is resetting the device to remember a zero. So why do you think that is necessary? Why do we have to complicate the design one more time to incorporate this feature? What happens when you first turn on a computer? You're powering up the computer. What happens to all the SR latches? They all have unknown states, okay? which is problematic, okay? Because if the entire computer, if all the chips, all the components have an unknown state, what are you gonna do? The computer's gonna do some crazy stuff, okay? You don't want your computer to do, you, you don't want your computer to do some crazy stuff. So that's why when you power up the computer, as the power supply ramps up the power to a certain voltage, during that ramp up, there's a chip called what we call a watchdog chip or a regulator chip. It will hold the reset pin of all the components to zero for a certain amount of time until power is stabilized. So what does that do? It resets everything to a no state. So all your video cards, your processor, all the registers in your processor, they are all reset to a no state. So when power is, is stabilized, then the reset is released, which means now your, all your devices can you know, continue operation as quote unquote normal. But it has a known starting point, okay, which is important. All right, so the reset pin is very, very important, you know, because in, in actual real world devices, the power up state is otherwise unknown. Okay, so we are almost done here. So now we go for the last crazy mm -hmm. picture, which is this one here. So we'll go ahead and zoom out just a little bit because you know, otherwise I can't fit the entire design into the screen. It's harder for me to do it with the scroll button. So I'm gonna to try to use the mouse here to carefully scroll it. There we go, okay. And what I'm doing is I'm using the little touch point thingy on my keyboard, best user interface ever, unless you're playing a video game. I actually play video games using that button too. My son looked at me you know, playing that video game, and I was uh, you know, in the game, you know, my character was a sniper. My son was looking at me going, like, how can you use that little button thingy you know, and, and play that game? I go like, it's the best thing ever. Anyway, so each one of these boxes is a resettable, edge-sensitive, gated D flip box. Okay, so every single box of these is one of the designs that we just looked at, okay? So what about this whole thing, okay? So when you look at this whole thing, the design is actually surprisingly easy because the reset pin, which is this one here, 
is multi-drop. So you can see that how the reset input pin is going to every single reset of the individual component. What about the clock pin? Same thing. So when you look at the clock pin here, it goes to the clock here, the clock here, the clock here, and so on. It is also a multi-drop. What about the enable pin? Same deal. Okay, this is the enable pin, and you can see how you know the, it is also multi-drop. So go like, okay, so if everybody is sharing exactly the same signals or the same input pins, what is the purpose of the whole thing? Wait, there's one thing that is not shared. It is the data pin. So the input data pin is X8, which means it is an eight bit wide input pin. It goes through a splitter so that we extract bit zero, one, two, and all the way up to bit seven. And each one of the data pin goes to a different device. In other words, each one of these deeper clocks is remembering a different bit from the input. We good so far? All right. What about the output pin? What about the Q output pin? Same thing. This Q output pin, which is a single bit, is only contributing to bit zero of the overall output pin. This one here is only contributing to bit one of the overall output pin, and all the way down to the last one, which is only contributing to bit seven of the overall output pin. In other words, one way to look at this is to call it a multi-bit individual clock, okay? But there's another name for a multi-bit deeper clock. It is simply called a register. Are we good so far? All right. So what can we do with a register? Well, a few things. We can reset a register, okay? By using the reset pin, we can reset the register to all zeros, okay? So it becomes just all zeros. We can enable a register so that whenever the clock goes from zero to one, all eight bits of the data input pin will be remembered by the register. The output of the register is always reflecting what it has remembered up to this point. So you don't, you, you don't have an option to turn off the output of a register. Is that okay so far? Hmm? Because you know, most of the time we want to treat eight bits as a single integer or um, you know, signed or unsigned. We want to treat all eight bits as one single unit. Yep. So when the input, do they all have the same input or are they all different? You mean the clock enable in the and reset? The data. The data? Yeah. So, so this is an eight bit data input pin. Yeah. And that's why it has to be split into eight individual bits. So this input pin by itself has eight zeros and one. So they're all, the, each of them are different. They are independent. They can be the same, but they're independent. In other words, the input can be zero, 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 zero. But, the, but between the zeros, they're independent. They just so happen to be the same, but each one can change by itself. All right. So let's go ahead and take a look at a circuit that makes use of a register. Okay, so we are moving on to what we call a clocked <coughs> circuit. So now we go to another circuit here. I'll just call this circuit counter. So the way this circuit works is I need to get um, a register. So a register is already a component in Logisim. There's no need to make one ourselves. And this is what the register looks like, okay? So let me first describe the pins of a register. Let me get to another magnification level. This is good. This is the data pin. This is you know, the same as the data pin in the previous picture. This is enable, okay, which is the same as the enable that we saw earlier. This is the clock. So if I magnify this picture a little bit more, okay, you can see the clock pin is not CLK. It looks like a little wedge, okay? It looks like a triangle. That's the clock pin, okay? So you know, next time when you use a register, just remember the clock pin does not spell CLK. It is simply represented by a rectangle, I mean triangle. This is the reset pin, which is also not spelled as reset. It simply has a zero as a label, I guess if appropriate. 
and this is the output, which is the Q pin. So now what we're going to do is we are going to take a adder. So the adder is under arithmetic. So now we pull an adder like so. Okay. So this is an adder. The adder has two inputs because you can add two numbers, right? So one number is coming from the output of the register. Yeah, that's pretty easy. And then the other one is going to be a constant. So I'm going to go to wiring to get a constant. And I want to specify that constant to be a bit wide because it has to match the width of the adder, which is a bit by default. And then what we're adding is 0, 1 in hexadecimal. So now we connect this to the other input of the adder. This is C in. C in of an adder is doing the same job as K0 as when we, when we talk about the binary addition module. So that's K0, and K0 is an input pin. And that's what I have been trying to tell you guys, right? You know, K0 is not always going to be a zero because it is an input to the adder. So it is a single bit, and the value is just zero here. Okay, so we put this over here. And then the output of the adder is going to go back to the input of the register, like so. And then we're going to have you know, an input pin to control the enable, another input pin to control the clock, and then another input pin to go to the reset. There is one difference between this design and the design that I just talked about. In the default implementation in Logisim, the reset pin will reset the register when it is a one instead of when it's a zero. Okay. You can always force a value in the register by clicking on the register itself using the poking tool, and then you can change the number. So if I want this to be four or five in hexadecimal, I can force the value four or five into a register. But if I want to reset it, all I have to do is to make the reset pin a one, and now it goes back to zero. Is that okay so far? So the question now is, how does this work? Because the register is outputting zero, the adder is already outputting a one. So how come the register is not changing from zero to a one? Well, that's the whole point of today's class. First of all, it is not enabled, okay? If a register is not enabled, it ignores everything else, okay? It is as if it's not enabled. So the first thing we need to do is to enable the register by clicking this pin here. But still, nothing is happening. How come the register is still zero, zero in hexadecimal? Well, because it only updates when the clock is transitioning from zero to one. Okay, so observe very carefully. If I click this pin, ding, it goes from zero, zero to a zero, one. But then it stops because there's no transition here anymore. So right now, at, right at this point, the output of the register is indeed a one, okay? And the output of the adder is indeed a two. But the two, even though it is presented to the data port, it is not remembered because it is waiting for another rising edge of the clock. So the clock is right here. The clock is already a one, so in order to have another rising edge, I have to reset it back to zero first, then I click it again, so watch carefully. Now it is a two. So this is what we call a clocked circuit, which means the operation when the register updates is controlled by the clock. So it's a clocked circuit. Sort of, okay, so if you alternate between zero and one, Yep. Yep. So if you want to repeat this entire experiment, you can turn it off, turn this off, and then reset, and now you can go again. So this is an interesting, this is a very small circuit, by the way, but it does illustrate you know, how you can make a circuit 
that can count. Okay, so how fast you're counting up depends on how fast you're you're ticking the clock pin. So instead of using an actual clock pin, let me change this to a. And instead of using a general input pin, I'm changing it to a clock pin. So the clock pin is right here. It looks almost just like an input pin. And you can click it too, by the way. So this is dark green, it is a zero. Now it is um, one, back to a zero, back to a one. But nothing is happening, nothing is happening to the register because it is not enabled. Very good. Okay, so the clock is clocking fine, okay, but if the device is not enabled, it's not updated. So then some people will ask, so what is the big deal of the clock pin? Well, unlike a regular input pin where you have to do the clicking, the clock pin can be clicked, but it can also be auto-clicked. Okay, so, it, it, so I'm going to change the frequency to eight times per second, and if you do this, you can see it is kind of doing its own clicking by itself, right? And then if I enable the device, then it will start to count. Kind of cool. And if I reset it, as long as the reset pin is a one, the value of the register is held to a zero. But as soon as I release the reset, then it'll start counting up again. So are we doing good, doing okay with this? This is the one of the most basic mechanism of using a clock and a register in a clock circuit, which means the timing depends on you know when the clock is having a rising edge, and the falling edge doesn't really matter in this case, so it's only the rising edge that matters. All right, but looking at the time here, okay, we got a little bit more time, so what I'll do is I am going to well, I suppose I can save this. Fine, and put it into my folder. Let me just call this one counter, okay? And then I'm gonna load, you know, what you guys will be working on, basically for the rest of this semester. Not right now because we still got an exam on Wednesday, okay? But when we come back next week, what we'll be doing is we're gonna finish up the design of the processor. Well, okay, we are not actually doing the design of the processor. I have already the whole thing designed, but we'll learn how it works and then how to use it to write code. All right, so let me pull the processor into the screen. <laughs> yep, that's the processor. But the whole thing fits into Logisyn. It is not very complicated compared to actual processors. This is kind of like a very simple processor. And, but we already recognize some components. This is a register. This is an adder. And here we have the same setup. This is a register. This is an adder. Now, it has a lot more stuff to it, okay? But nonetheless, okay, this is the heart, okay? This is basically providing, quote unquote, the heartbeat of the entire processor. So we'll be using this processor to write code, okay, that is normally written in C. And we'll get to recursion, we'll get to pointers, we'll get to arrays, we'll get to structures in this class using this tiny little processor. Um, I cannot talk about RAM because it's going to take a little bit longer than I have time today, but the RAM component is right here. This entire processor has just 256 locations of RAM. That's all it has. So we can already implement certain kind of interesting um, functions. Uh, Fibonacci is one, you know, in a recursive way. Uh, we can also implement binary search tree algorithms, at least you know, the traversal of one. Um, we can do some fun stuff here, okay? We can implement, you know, string copy. Um, there are a few things we can do with this tiny little processor. And that's basically what we'll be doing. You know, once we understand the, the, the rest of the components of the processor, then we'll be starting to write actual opcode into the RAM here so that this processor can get the opcode from RAM in order to decide what it needs to do. All right, so that's kind of the general, um, what did they call the, uh, they call this the, the roadmap, you know, from here on. Are there any questions about this processor? 
Not in the moment. Okay, very good. <laughs> so I do have to, you know, kind of tell people ahead of time, you know, disclaimer. If anyone is planning to transfer to Berkeley, this is the wrong class, okay? The reason why I said that is because, you know, in computer architecture and assembly language programming, which is what this class is about, the core of the class is about the actual coding using the processor. So there are two ways to stretch this class. The way I stretch this class is going down in terms of lower level logic. So I actually touch on logic design a little bit. How do we make the comp how to make a processor? You know, what is inside the processor and so on. So over the next week or so, you know, because on Wednesday we have exam one. So next week we'll be going over you know, all the basic components of what is a multiplexer, what is a demultiplexer, what is RAM, what is ROM, basically what is the actual really useful components in a processor, in addition to registers. And then the week after that, we'll be starting to code it. Okay, we'll start, we'll be starting to write instructions to understand how instructions execute in this processor. So that's one way to stretch the class, is to go to the lower level side of processor design. Berkeley, on the other hand, wants to stretch it on the other end. So they want this class, this kind of class to also talk about virtual memory, to talk about interrupts, to talk about how to interface with an operating system, and also how, you know, did I mention virtual memory? I think I did. So they want to stretch it on the opposite end, which is basically making a higher performance processor that is modern, instead of going to the lower end, which is looking into exactly what is inside a basic processor. How does it take? How does it work in general? So the way I stretch this class is not compatible with how Berkeley wants this class to be. So that's why this class is not directly transferable to Berkeley. If you are, if you want to transfer to Berkeley, uh, there are very few community colleges where the equivalence of this class is actually transferable. I believe Diablo is one of them. So. So I, 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 I hope nobody in this class is planning to transfer to Berkeley, okay, only to find out that. What do you mean by this class does not transfer? It, I mean, you know, I think it is important to stretch the lower end of this whole thing, but Berkeley thinks it's important to stretch the higher end of you know, what we talk about in this class. Just a matter of, you know, which side do you want to become? Do you want to be a computer science person or do you want to be a computer engineer person? I think that's the only minor difference between which end to stretch. All right, any questions? Any questions? Any questions about the exam on Wednesday? This is not part of the exam, yep. We do have quote unquote a lab today, which means I will be here as long well as somebody in the class is here until 1.20 p.m. So the lab today, okay, so let's go to the lab. There you go. So let me go ahead and release the lab and give you guys the access code to the lab. So today's lab is about you know, PD and NC propagation. <clears throat> it's already released. Um, I need to give you guys the access code. And I'll remember what the access code is, so I have to go in to figure out the access code. So the due date of the lab, so-called, is on Wednesday, right before class, okay? Now obviously you guys need some time to study, so I would not wait until the last moment to do today's lab. So let me give you the access code, and then I'll talk a little bit about what this lab is about. So the access code is in settings, and it is step master. Getting this one, so this one is called step master. So you might want to write this down because the lab is not due until Wednesday, which means if you cannot finish it today, you still have approximately two more days to do it. 
This one is about tracking down the changes you know, of the SR latch that we have been talking about since last Monday. Okay, so this one is not on the one crazy one today that we, we talked about, the edge sensitive gated deeper flop. That's the one that I worked on today. This one is based on the one that we talked about on last Monday, which is significantly simpler compared to what we worked on today. So um, you have a spreadsheet that you have to create that you have to copy from mine. And then all you have to do is to follow the you know, changes, the, the ANC, the changes of the input pins and track down all the changes the same way that I did both from last Monday's deal class and also on in today's class. Basically the method is the same. It's just that you have to kind of reflect all the changes in the spreadsheet and don't forget to share your spreadsheet with me. My email address is a part of the homework assignment already. So when you turn it in, make sure that you share your Google Sheet with me. All right, so I think that's all for today. Are there any questions, anything you want me to kind of go over? So I do want to double check with everybody. Okay, the scope of the exam on Wednesday is everything up to and including double representation. So that means the flags are part of it, okay? Double is part of it, binary addition, binary subtraction, any base addition and any base subtraction is also included, okay? Base conversion is included. So just remember the scope, okay? Because you know, the exams that we went through, the, the practice exam from spring, may not include you know, all the, the entire scope. Are we good so far? Open book, open notes, everything should be on paper, okay? So I don't want somebody to bring in a, an iPad or another device, electronic device, and ask, can I use this one? No, you know, because we said it's gonna be on paper. All right, if you want to be sure that you have enough space to write your answers, bring your paper with you, Okay, it's okay to attach your paper to the exam. Otherwise, there should be enough space on the exam to write your answer, but if you want to be sure, you can also bring your own paper. Any other questions that you want to ask about exam one? Okay, seeing none, I'm going to stop the recorder. So you- Just make sure that the time expires. Yeah. So you go to the spreadsheet and then what you do, so when, once you get to the spreadsheet, you go to file and then you say make a copy. And then make sure that you put the copy in your own folder because if you don't specify the folder, it will try to put it in the same folder where it's from and you cannot create a file in that folder. So when you make a copy, make sure that you point it back to your drive first. And then at the end, make sure you share that uh, spreadsheet with me I would do it first, okay? I would just kind of go to share here and make sure that you type my email address, which is also included in the homework assignment, and just do, do it right away you know, before you forget. Because every year somebody forgets, <laughs> I go like, I cannot see the spreadsheet, I cannot do any grading. You do not need to do the diagram, but if you want to use your know, logism to help you out, that's fine. Yeah, but logism cannot give you all the intermediate steps. You can only go from the input pin to the second pin. But the spreadsheet needs to have all the steps. Right, one way to double check whether your process is fine. Also, you have to check that. Hmm? Well, it's not just 50-50, because you know, in addition to just the output pin, you also know, well, I guess it is. In, in the case of the SR latch, yes. But in the case of the D flip flop, you have so many internal states. So it's not really just looking at the output pin, but you also need to make sure the internal states of all the components are consistent. Yep. But for the SR latch, it's so simple that there's only one stage. So you know, the output states is basically the same thing as internal states. All right, cool.
So I am going to stop the recorder and upload the recording. I will go get something to drink, okay, get a little bit of water, and that will be